It's the moment you've all been waiting for when we reveal the definitive rising list of the week's winners and losers. Um, Emily, let me start with you. What is your winner of the week? Who so, or what or whatever? I'm not really. <laughs> I'm now realizing actually that the first winner should be Sagar, who missed this week in a, another miserable news cycle. Another while he was on week, vacation. Here, week here in Wonderland. <laughs> um, no, my actual winner is HBO. Believe it or not, um, HBO has actually a really well done documentary out this week called The Swamp that, for once, I'm telling you, this is rare and it's very, very useful, gives Republican politicians an opportunity to actually share their side of the argument here huh. and reform-oriented Republican politicians. So someone like Thomas Massey, fascinating member of Congress, talks to them about what can actually be done to break up cronyism and break up corruption in Washington. They're Trump-friendly for the most part, but there's some really fascinating conversations between people like Matt Gates and Katie Hill. This documentary huh. is my winner for the week, and HBO is a winner for the week for actually having the, the audacity to air a documentary that gives Republican politicians a, a relative relatively unfiltered platform. Hmm. It's a winner because um, this is such an important issue and it's so rare that it's discussed with honesty. So I, I really recommend you check it out. I have not watched it. I'm going to check it out maybe this weekend if I have time, if my kids give me the time and space to do such a thing, which is unlikely. Um, but you know, the thing about Thomas Massey having lived in Kentucky and mm -hmm. he represents a district in Kentucky, like I probably disagree with this guy on almost everything. But I always kind of respect the person who's willing to be like, it's like the vote is 434 to one. And they're that one. I mean, he's willing to, to be hated. He wanted everybody to come back, remember to vote on the stimulus bill. And his reason for wanting to come back was that he thought it was too much money, which is not my, I thought it was ridiculous. Like I thought, you know, we didn't do enough in that initial stimulus bill. But I always respect the people who are willing to go against everyone else and be the fly in the ointment. And that's kind of Thomas Mass. That's totally, he tells a really great story about how he got a call from President Trump ahead of a vote. And this is in the documentary. And Trump said, listen, if you don't vote with us on this issue, you're gonna get a primary challenge. Massey, of course, voted the way that he wanted to vote. He wasn't listening to the president. And he, within 24 hours, got that primary challenge. And he goes to the, you know, the Capitol Hill Club, which is kind of a Republican lobbying watering hall, hole, and shows this is where I am. This is where I have to go now, all because I took one wrong vote against the president. He does a great job. Um, everyone in the, in the film does a great job sort of peeling back the curtain hmm. on lobbying and corruption in Washington, D.C. Ultimately, they get into this like sort of cliched thing about how compromise is so wonderful when, as we talked about yesterday, compromise is just cronyism for the Usually, most part. Usually, the compromises but. that happen here are exactly what you should be terrified of. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, all right, so my winner for the week and it has been a long time since I felt that I could say this, is progressives. Some huge wins this week. Rashida Tlaib was the most sort of, you know, they said she was in the most danger of the members of the squad. Not only does she win, she wins easily against an opponent that she had faced twice in the past. One time she, wo she won narrowly. One time she lost narrowly. This time, hands down, she won no problem. Um, Marquita Bradshaw. This came out of nowhere. She's this leftist, progressive, Medicare for all, Green New Deal, backed by the Democratic Socialists. She beats, in the Democratic primary in Tennessee, to run for the open Senate seat there, she beats the DSCC, Democratic Party-backed candidate, who had raised $2 million plus dollars, and Marquita raised 8K, 10K, somewhere in there. I mean, next to no money. And she comes out of nowhere and wins this Democratic primary. Tough road to hoe for the November, et cetera, et cetera, but shows there's really something going on. And then, of course, Cori Bush, who we got to talk to this week as well, stuns everyone, beating Congressman Lacey Clay Jr. Seat had been held by him and his dad for more than 50 years. She's a, a new you know, member of the squad and the first one to take out a, a CBC member, which is really significant. It's not just the old white guys. Mm -hmm. People are actually looking and saying, no, no. The fact that you've been here for a long time is not enough. We actually want you to truly represent us. And I think Corey is going to be a I think she's going to send shockwaves through this town and really throughout the country as people realize that you are on notice. And so, look, I look back to the Tea Party era, and we're not quite there in terms of the number of incumbents who've been threatened or knocked out. But when they see victories like this and they see what ways the winds are blowing, even outside of the new members who will come in, that changes the attitude of incumbents here, where they no longer feel safe 
to just do their normal corporate lobbyist crap right? They no longer feel like they can just get away with that and no one's going to call them out on it. They no longer feel comfortable to just stay here and not actually do the work for their community. So I think these, these, these wins this week are really a bit of a shift and also help to set up what could be a very contentious and interesting dynamic if there is a Biden administration. You know, this is one of the most interesting things about Bradshaw's win and about Bush's win is that they didn't have opponents who took them for granted like Joe Crowley, right? Like they had opponents who were actually trying to win these races and yeah. they still managed to pull it off. So like you said, incumbents are on notice and it's still not really working in some of these races for some reason. And I'm just curious as to what it is that's brewing on the ground. I mean, we're talking about Missouri. Right. Uh, and not the Bronx. We're talking about Missouri. And so there's something going on right now. I don't know what it is. It's some combination of factors. I mean, I think that the protest movement is really one of the most significant social movements that we have seen in decades. Mm. And, you know, I think you can look at Marquita. I think you can look at Jamal Bowman. I think you can look at Charles Booker, who, if it wasn't a pandemic, would beat Amy McGrath with a similarly massive financial disparity. Certainly you can look at Cori Bush, who is a Black Lives Matter activist. I mean, she really is the first like Black Lives Matter candidate directly from that movement who will be heading to Congress. And so, I, yeah, there is an, a really new wind blowing in this country. And, um, you know, these winds have, have come out of nowhere. And I think a lot of people are reassessing the things that they thought that they knew about politics right now. Um, all right, time for our losers. Um, also, Sagar. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, for a lot of reasons. No, no, no. no. I'll stop picking on Sagar. Um, loser, from my perspective this week, is Hollywood. This is something that a Pan, Pan America report this week kind of un, uh, broke down all of Hollywood's complicity with the Chinese Communist Party. This expands on reporting that I've done. It expands on reporting that a lot of people have done. It's an extremely important issue. It makes Hollywood look absolutely terrible. Actually, I did an interview recently with a, uh, a Hollywood executive named Chris Fenton. You can check this out on the Federalist YouTube, which has a lot of good stuff, um, and would recommend that you subscribe to that. As nice Saga reminded me to plug it. Um, <laughs> but Chris, is he has a new book out that just blows the story wide open and talks about actually how how many how many decisions are made in Hollywood? The self censorship that goes on before mm -hmm. the scripts even get to the Communist Party censors in Hollywood. It's a hugely important issue. They make so much money off of the Chinese market. And the Pen America report that came out this week, I think, really gave momentum um, that has been building and building and building this year, whether it's legislation from Ted Cruz. Um, this conversation is getting bigger. It's getting harder for Hollywood to ignore. And this report that was released this week has some details in it um, that are make Hollywood look just absolutely terrible and is going to continue moving the ball forward in this conversation. Such an important issue. All right. I will check that report out. My loser of the week, and it's also been a while since I could say this because he's been doing pretty well, is Joe Biden, who had a number of disastrous moments, um, <laughs> has kind of confirmed the view that the best thing he could possibly do is to do nothing at all. Uh, he had his, you know, meltdown. He gets asked about a cognitive test. He melts down over that and accuses the interviewers like, are you a junkie and do you need to take a drug test to the interviewer? <laughs> then he gets asked about race. Everybody sort of holds their breath. It never goes well. He says the Latino community. Look, I love the way he did the, like the Trumpian. Like a lot of people don't know this. Yes, the Latino community <laughs> is very diverse. Unlike the black community, yeah. has to play clean up on that. Look, Joe Biden is a gap. But will these things in particular hurt him in the polls? No. But at the same time, we're seeing, and we covered this on the show too. President Trump is gaining a little bit of ground back. A mm -hmm. um, couple points. He's certainly stabilized and maybe actually gaining a little bit more um, in, ter in terms of the national polls in particular, but also in key swing states. I compared the um, where Biden is nationally versus where Hillary was at this time. And now, granted, she kind of had a convention bump. Yeah. So this was one of her high places. He's not going to probably really get the benefit of a convention bump, neither is Trump, because there aren't really conventions to speak of. But they were in roughly the same spot. So for a while, it was the case that Biden was way outperforming where she was last time around. It's not exactly the case anymore. So that is the real reason why I'm naming him. Even with the pandemic, even with Congress failing to come up with a deal, all the disastrous mistakes. President Trump has had unbelievably disastrous interviews like day after day, week after week. And still with all of that, 
seems to be getting back into this race. Benefits from low expectations, but I mean, Joe Biden, frankly. Right, yeah, but Joe Biden's campaign desperately needs a strategy for how to deal with his inability to get through these interviews without gaffes, but also just without stumbling through his sentences and looking like he's not fit for office. That's and the they thing. don't have it. I yeah. Mean, yeah, because you said this doesn't hurt him in the polls. I agree. But I think, you know, also where it could hurt him in the polls is just in terms of people. It's not a policy thing. It's not a political thing. It's just like, I, I can't vote for this guy. He's, he, he won't be able to take the oath of office. You know? Yeah, it's, no, uh, I think that's exactly right. If there are more and more moments like this where people look and go, can this guy really handle the job? Mm -hmm. That's the thing that you don't want to unfold. So we saw a little bit of a glimpse of that today. And we're going to have more rising for you after this.